um, we've got um, we've got three um, we've got three speakers coming on next to talk, tell us a little bit about the PRSB headings. We've got um, the return, if you like, of Ian, uh, but he'll be accompanied today with um, Philip and Phil, and they'll introduce themselves in more uh, detail. So, guys, where are you? Hi, again, for those of you who were here yesterday. Um, so this is, a, by special request, we've got three people in this session to squeeze into 28 minutes. Um, and I'm heading this up, and we're talking about the PRSB and the headings project. And I'm never quite sure whether it's ARCP or AMRC or PRSB. I'm just going to call them the PRSB headings. And I'm here as a little bit of an insider. I've worked on lots of PRSB projects and RCP projects but I'm inclined to poke the beast a little bit. And so I was kind of invited to be a little bit contentious. And then it was decided that it might be safer if I had a couple of minders from the PRSB. So <laughs> we'll be joined, joined later to rebut all the evil, nasty things I've said uh, by uh, Phil Scott and, uh, Philip Scott and, and Phil Cousin in, in a few minutes. So I'm just going to kick off and give you, it's a kind of background to where I think this, this idea came from. Um, and if we look at it in terms of Michael's story, you know, this is, this is the document that we're really talking about, the standards of the clinical structure and content of paper, paper records. And here is an example of medication. Uh, now, it's quite interesting. You can't really see the details, but if you could, what Jeremy just showed you in terms of the FIRE model and what I work with the open-air model, they would look very, very similar to those headings. Uh, very, very similar, and that's not an accident. Uh, similarly, if you were to look at the fire allergies model and the PRS B allergies and uh, uh, allergies and adverse reactions heading, you would see considerable similarities. But as I said yesterday, getting this kind of structuring right is vital to the process of both uh, getting interoperable systems, but also getting new systems. You know, getting this hard stuff shareable by new entrants to the market. And it's pretty obvious, I think, to any of us in, the, in, in this job that health records are fundamentally hierarchical. They are, you know, sections, blocks, tick boxes, all the way down. And that's reflected both in the paper documentation and, of course, when we start to use these things in an electronic method, there is some kind of hierarchy, folders, structures. This is an example of a, an open source Ripple application, a demonstrator being built by Tony Shannon in Leeds. And you can see down the left hand side, we've got what you might call some headings, problem diagnosis, contacts, allergies, these sort of things. Every single system of any degree of sophistication will have that kind of thing in it. So this initiative came through, I'm not sure exactly the history, I think one of my colleagues will say that at the time, you know, can we start to get some real clinical involvement in defining some standards around the way that we organize clinical records? So if you like, Jeremy's uh, talk before me was very much right down in the detail, you know, right down at what you do with an individual data item in a record. This is much more about, can we add some uh, standardization uh, to the overall structure of a health record so we try to make it easier for people as they move back and forward and maybe help move some interoperable data back and forward. And I think it was a real breakthrough in getting clinical engagement and actually clinical ownership of this to say this is not a technical problem, this is a clinical problem. And we have both a right but more importantly a responsibility as a, clinic, as a clinical community to get hold of this problem and not just throw it over the wall at our technical colleagues. Without a doubt, headings are really helpful and useful for breaking up complex documents and you know, simplifying a complex record structure. But does that give us interoperability? And I worried about this. I've been, I, I hope I've been supportive of this work from the very start. But it did worry me because there were promises being made. There were people saying, don't worry about the content definitions. The PRSB headings will give us that. And they will just provide those standards, they'll give it to the technical people, and all will be well. And I just thought, there's a gap. There's a gap here between what we're able to do with this kind of idea, useful though it is, and what we actually need to do to get systems flowing, the data flowing more easily. And there's just some examples of some actually very worked out parts of the, of the headings document about medication and name, but there's woolly stuff in there as well. Now, th that's fine. This headings document doesn't have to be fine-grained, but don't pretend that that will deliver an interoperable 
idea about how we represent medication change by just having it as a textual description in a paper document. So there's a gap, I think, or uh, there has been a gap in the expectation and the reality. But sections and headings are well understood in international standards. On the left hand side, I put, picked this from Matt's presentation yesterday, CDA and FIRE and other versions of HL7 all have an idea of sections or headings, but they also have something underneath that, in, underneath that they will call a clinical statement or an entry, which is a much more precise definition. And that's the same in the open air world, which is mine. We have the same idea of headings that allow us to break up documents, but the really detailed semantic precise interoperable de definitions are at a layer beho below that. Sections, headings are about organisation. Don't invest the meaning in sections. Because people want to reorganise their records in different, in different ways. So the devil really is in the detail. We have got to get from this kind of helpful, really helpful uh, you know, clinical guidance about what might be an analogy record to this kind of level of detail, which is still clinical, Nothing, nothing technical there. That's the, uh, the open air and fire uh, allergy uh, model that we, we worked up together. That's the kind of detail that you need to support real, real systems. If all you want to do is to have some general uh, viewable documents with some nice breaking up of content, this kind of documentation is absolutely great. If you want to have the kind of actionable interop future that we've really been talking about the last three days, we have to do something else. I firmly believe that PRSB is absolutely the right organization to manage that. I firmly believe that this should be a clinical responsibility, but we have to get it, our us, our clinical community, working at this level and using that as high level guidance that is then further worked up. This is complex, but it's clinically complex. It's not technically complex. So, as clinicians, we need to go into the detail if we want interoperable record standards. The complexity is largely clinical, not technical. And Jeremy's already you know, gone through some of the complexities about what happens when you get down into the details of how you do medication. But it's only people like, like Jeremy and myself who have a clinical background, pharmacy colleagues, who can really deal with that and try to resolve some of these difficulties of overlap of, of terminology, how we break things down. The future is absolutely, in my view, clinician-led development of granular, rigorously defined components of medical records, and I hope that PRSB has a major role in that. And I'll hand over to Phil Cozen. Um, I'm Phil Cozen, and I'm Clinical Director of PRSB, a role that I've recently taken on, but been a GP for 20 years and really yeah, used the technology um, of recording information at point of care for yeah, for all that time, the computer sat in front of me. Um, one of the challenges has been the, you know, the letters that, you know, that we get back from, yeah, from hospitals, uh, from outpatient departments, discharge summaries, that have got a real uh, challenge in how, how the information is presented. How do you get consistency? Make sure key bits of data are in the, are in the key, key parts. And yeah, just a quick journey through history. So this, this journey goes back to about 2002, when, um, yeah, the RCP, RCP at that time investigated the structure of the medical records. There was some work that done then to define the headings that uh, Ian has gone through in a bit of detail. Yeah, so he's explained yeah, the headings. And I think we're now on a journey of how do we take, make that journey from structured documents to structured in granular information that's coded and can be used to, to help drive the interoperability. Um, PRSB itself was formed in 2013 um, as a registered company and yeah, as part of that is really trying to take forward this journey. So why the PRSB and why is it, uh, yeah, in my mind anyway, yeah, key to, to take it yeah, to, to this piece of work? First of all, it covers four nations, yeah, so it's, it's UK wide. Um, yeah, it's yeah, been established as being the, you know, the, the go-to organisation for that clinical involvement. And basically what we're trying to do um, is to make sure that we've got the clinician buy-in to these documents, but also at the same time, we're bringing patients on that journey. So part of our, our work is working very closely with patients to say, yeah, in these documents, documents that will be shared with the patient, what information is key to bringing them with us. 
the advisory board is absolutely critical to, you know, to our work. So you know, we've got a whole range of you know, all the Royal Colleges you know, being involved and, and working with us, um, and then various other organisations listed at the bottom, uh, which include N uh, NHS Digital, HL7, um, you know, Tech UK, and you know, we're, we're, we're working very closely with Interopen, so trying to look at how do we bring Interopen into, into those discussions. But it's that advisory board which gives us a lot of the, um, you know, the clinical feedback of the, the work that we're doing. This diagram um, just briefly goes through the, the process that we follow. So at the top, identification of a standard that needs development goes to an expert reference group. Um, there's a focus on the technical standards, but actually the key bit is working out what are the, you know, the professional, the clinical standards that need to go into that piece of work. So that, you know, the bottom circle uh, down here, it's really just looking um, yeah, an iterative review about how do we take yeah, a draft standard, work it through a process, and come up with some firm recommendations. Those recommendations go through an um, independent assurance, and then the advisory group is asked to comment and feedback so that, so that we, we get representation from all the different colleges, all the different professionals about how we can make this work. That's then hopefully implemented. I think there have been some challenges about how you, uh, you know, drive the implementation, how you support adoption and maintenance, and there we're working very closely uh, with NHS Digital. Now, I believe that this standard, yeah, this process can be used to help support the work that we're doing on fire, taking it from a document level down to um, a granular level. And recently, yeah, we've undertaken a piece of work um, yeah, in conjunction with others to start looking at that process. I'm going to invite Philip Scott just to talk you through that process and, and what we found. Thank you, Phil. Um, so my name is Philip Scott. I'm um, a member of the board of PRSB representing BCS Health. I've been involved with the um, setup of PRSB from the early stages. Uh, my current role is helping with the technical assurance of the PRSB standards. So, taking up uh, the point that Ian made, again violently agreeing with him, surprisingly perhaps, um, it is that the, there is a gap. Uh, and so we undertook a project in 2014 to try and say, well, how can we close that gap? So when we look at the, the human readable standard, and, that, and that's what it was designed for, it was only ever designed as a, as a guidance for uh, human clinicians, how can we get from this human readable thing to something that actually means something to a computer? Because as Ian rightly pointed out, these things frankly are very vague um, and you couldn't honestly say that something is or is not compliant to that in any meaningful sense. So we, we took that question, uh, we took the specific case of an outpatient letter, which, which now is being done for real, but then we did it just as a test. Um, we, to make it manageable, we restricted it down to just the data set which was present in the European patient summary. And we then said, well, can we take that and turn that into a computable artifact? Uh, we were fortunate that at that time there was a European project running called Semantic Health Net, and they helped us to fund that project. So we, we achieved a number of things, and some of it Ian's already alluded to, that, that there was a common approach to this, to get from the human readable kind of tables and headings into something computable. And the first thing is, is to develop a mind map. So just to, for, to help ordinary clinicians understand that this hierarchical structure of this contains this, this contains this, just the compositional relationship. And that we had to go through this process of data definitions that we have to go beyond the very general textual language of the headings and come up with a precise definition that actually means something. From that, in, in the particular proof of concept, we then, well, Ian actually designed the archetype model that went alongside that uh, outpatient letter. And we didn't have time to produce the actual artifacts, but we then obviously could see the, the path, the method by which we could then develop, um, particularly CDA was the thing we were focusing on at that time. So the question of is it conformant, the, the conclusion we reached was actually you can only define conformance against the implementation artifact. So you can derive, let's say, a CDA template from the model and you can say yes I'm conformant to that CDA template, 
but that's the only real conformance that you can declare. That's a kind of second-hand conformance to the headings, if you like. And the other thing, which I think is really important, is that we demonstrated it was possible to cooperate <laughs> between different standards groups. Um, and so the, all the people illustrated at the bottom there, um, we all worked together in a very productive way, each contributed different elements of knowledge, different elements of skill uh, to make this work. But, the, but there are open questions. So uh, as Ian alluded to, well, you know, are the headings just completely meaningless? Uh, you know, from com from a computable perspective, um, it is is everything just down at the detail level, uh, and clearly that's that's one end of the argument. The other argument is to say, well, actually, you know, a lot of the record it will still be free text. There will still be a clinical summary, for example, and we just have to label it as such. And of course, for the the compositional design in itself, we have to be able to say, well, this heading contains that, that heading contains this. And of course, I haven't put it on here, but the other um, important thing to think about is the human readability, uh, and not just the clinician, but the patient. So if we're saying that the discharge summary really ought to be addressed to the patient and copied to the GP, then it needs to be represented in a way which the patient can comprehend. And I think really, you put it here as a binary opposition, but actually it's a, a spectrum of opinion that we, we just need to work through uh, the practicalities, the pragmatic reality of how these headings can be used. And the other point, which uh, Ian alluded to also, is well, how does this apply to user interface design? Can we say that an application is uh, compliant with the headings? At the moment, I don't think we really can, but I think that's something worth exploring over time. So there's a, a summary of the, the process which we did in the proof of concept and which we've now uh, adopted as a, a fairly standard pattern through the projects that we've been running. So the headings document on the left was one of the inputs, the generic uh, clinical information standard. Then the, the, the human conversations, that's what it boils down to, to understand well, what does this really mean in practice? Um, the, the dialogue of what well, does it mean this, does it mean that, is it measured like this, is it measured like that? To come up with something which is then represented in a generic uh, logical mind map representation. And then from that, uh, it can be represented in a range of technologies. Once we have a, an understanding of what the actual hierarchical relationships are, what the data definitions are, it could be represented in open air, it can be re represented in CDA, it can be represented in fire. So taking the example of uh, Michael, so if we take Michael's hospital discharge to GP, or if it was uh, Michael's mental health hospital admission equally, so then here's the data set that goes with it, represented in the, the generic mind map sense built from the, the PRSP headings. And in this case, um, it's, a, it's an old diagram, so it's, it's only illustrative. But there is a CDA model that is then developed from that, and that could be sent to the GP. So th there's, a, there's quite a pipeline of stuff for implementation. Um, right now you can go to the developer NHS UK website and you can find uh, some of the things which NHS Digital have developed as uh, implementable specifications. So we've got the hospital discharge summary with structured data for medicines, for allergies, for diagnoses and procedures. Um, there's a mental health discharge summary that's there right now that you can access. Also the crisis care summary. Some of the other things working on the emergency care discharge, the outpatient letter, um, new project for child health events. We heard yesterday about um, events triggering various actions. Um, also in the pipeline in the future, referrals and care planning. So there's quite a rich set of stuff, all at kind of various stages, some of it available now on the developer NHS UK website, some of it will be published in due course. For the actual clinical models, you can go to theprsb.org um, and ref rep reference the project documentation there. So looking to the future, um, what are we going to do with FHIR? Well, again, we did a proof of concept um, with clinical validation of FHIR profiles. Um, this is a, I'm not expecting to read this because the print's very small, but it'll be in the slides afterwards. This was a recommendation that PRSB made back to NHS Digital to say how we think this ought to work in the future. And 
Without getting into all the detail, what it boils down to is we think there needs to be collaboration between all of the stakeholder groups at every stage of the development. So right from the beginning, right from prioritisation, we need the NHS policy and programme input, we need input from InterOpen, from PRSB, from HR7, from whoever else is, is relevant. So we have that discussion of business requirements, how to assure things, and then we need to try to get as agile as we can. Obviously the NHS is a, a lumbering great super tanker, so agility is not its kind of natural style, but it, we want to get as close to that as we realistically can. We want to look at things like connectathons, not just technical but clinical. We want to look at having a ballot process to put this out for wide public consultation, uh, not public, no, open consultation. And we want to utilise the PRSB uh, clinical validation process. So and it's encouraging to say that you know, we seem to be uh, hearing receptive ears to that kind of thing and, and hopefully before very long we'll be able to see uh, a real collaborative open process get underway. So the vision of PRSB is really the whole of Michael's story and the whole of every patient's story. The vision is to optimise the health and well-being of UK citizens through the definition and widespread adoption. So we don't want these PRSB standards to just uh, be in a library somewhere. We want them to be adopted. So in summary, PRSB is a unique opportunity to put both patients and practitioners right at the front of health informatics, not out at the side somewhere. The structure and content standards are not the whole answer, but they are an important step forward. And they've also triggered the creation of community, the creation of activity among clinicians in a way that hadn't previously happened. So we do need to see a collaborative process, a pragmatic approach that looks at the whole system. And we really believe that will result in better outcomes, uh, better patient care, and data that is really useful, not just for operational purposes, but also secondary uses. So big data becomes good data. There's some further reading for you, and thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. So that, that hopefully will sort of set the scene for this collaborative vision that we want to sort of bring and share with everybody, that openness, that need for cooperation, and hopefully we'll, um, we'll touch on that later in the panel discussion. Um,